Well, 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 didn't expect to see you again. Yes, we're back for the sixth installment of Design a Product With Us, the series where we design a PicoNF project from scratch before your very eyes. In the last episode, we were doing panelization. The panels arrived. It's just the same thing, but there's lots of them in a panel. This episode is all about test jigs. We've made a product. Here's one that I've assembled from that panel that I broke apart. We've made a product, but we got to test it. So we need a jig. Let's get to it. For a lot of our stuff, we use a templated jig. This is our template that we can reuse for a lot of different boards. We have space for a Raspberry Pi Pico that can run the show, a bunch of supporting components. And then for PicoDev products, we can just have a connector glued to the board here that we can plug devices onto to test them. We can assemble these exactly as they are for a lot of PicoDev modules. Some other modules need a little bit more circuitry though. And for that, we can make a daughter board. This outline section here has a big breakout header. And so we can put a daughter board onto this motherboard and have a specific circuit to test our specific device. In this case, the PicoDev servo driver. So what do we need to test with something like this? We have a few really important things. We can plug in with a PicoDev connector and make sure that we can talk to the PCA9685 chip. That will test that the chip is functioning and that we have a, at least one working connector. We can inject a signal into one of the USB sockets to make sure that we have power and ground connected to each of these connectors. That will test both the continuity of the connector and that the soldering was successful for each of these four servo channels. Finally, we can test that we can actually generate a pulse on each of these pins. And I think it makes sense to generate a unique PWM on each pin to make sure that there are no shorts. You can imagine if we drove all the channels with the same identical pulse, but if there was a short between channels for some reason, then it would probably look like it still passes, even though there might be a short between two pins. But with a unique pulse length on each pin, we can make sure that we have signals coming out and no shorts. I originally included a couple of test points on the back of the board because we have the PicoDev breakout, we have test points for the PWM, and we have test points for the five volt from the USB connector. But that's not a very good test because it doesn't actually test any of the really the higher risk things, which are the connectors. If you just pogo onto a test jig like this, you're not testing a lot of the important stuff, which is the connector continuity. So we're actually gonna test it onto our test jig down so we can plug each of these servo channels in and do a more exhaustive test. And so here's what I've come up with. This is the daughter board that will go onto this test jig motherboard. You can see we have the same big header down the left-hand side. That will be our connection to the motherboard. And then we have a standard mounting pattern to hold it up off the board. There's a USB-C receptacle up here so that we can plug a USB cable into the test jig and route to the device under test. And that way we can test the USB socket. Likewise, there's a three pin header for each servo channel. So we have these four three pin headers to plug onto the board. And finally, for testing the PicoDev connection, our standard test jig already has some provisional footprints for that cable. So we'll just pick up straight from there. And here's our schematic. On the far left, we have our connection to the motherboard. We have our USB test and then this whole section on the right, this is for testing the servo three pin headers. So for the USB connector, we're just taking three volts and we're injecting that into the connector. And we're also passing through a couple of resistors and through the CC1 and CC2 pins. This is to make sure that we have the 5.1K resistors correctly soldered. These are the resistors that tell the upstream power supply, hey, give me up to three amps if you can. So it's important to check that those are functioning. And so here we have three analog pins that are doing a voltage measurement because we're creating a voltage divider with the resistors on the test jig and the resistors on this device under test. We also check that the device under test has a ground connection. And so for here, we just make sure that GP22 gets pulled to ground by the device under test. If that ground connection isn't soldered correctly, then this line will be pulled up to 3.3 volts. Now for the tricky bit, you know, it should be pretty simple in theory, to test for each of these connections. We can look that the ground pin gets pulled to ground. We can look that the power pin gets pulled to power, and we can look for a pulse coming out of the signal pin. So we can have a digital pin assigned to every one of these 
three by four, that's 12 pins. Only problem is our breakout, we've run out of pins if we do that. Our breakout doesn't have enough pins to service all of this. And okay, there are a few things you could do about it. You could do IO muxing. You could use an IO expander, write some code and put that IO expander on the daughter board so you can have a digital pin assigned to every single one of these things. And we can do that. We have IO expanders. We even have analog switches, which I considered using where you can literally just have that digital pin scan across multiple others by analog switching between them. Or you could use some logic ICs. You could use AND gates, OR gates, etc. And that was, that was the first solution that I thought of actually was to just use a couple of AND or OR gates because we wanna check that all the voltage pins are tied high and all the ground pins are tied low. So a couple of AND or OR gates would just be perfect. Now we prefer to use components that we already have in production uh, or the core electronic stocks. We can just put in an order and take them off the shelf to use in our test jigs. All the logic ICs that we have though, I think are only good for five volts. And this is a three volt test. What we do have in spades, however, are diodes. Yes, we've just got diodes by the reel. And so why not make a diode AND gate and a diode OR gate? Here's how you might go about putting together a diode AND gate. This is pretty old school, but very effective. And it uses components that we already have. We have our inputs A, B, and C. They're all tied together on the output with a pull-up resistor. And then the output has to be A and B and C. And so we can use the same philosophy, for example, to test that all the voltage pins are connected. If any one of these voltage pins isn't high, if it's instead pulled low by a pull-down resistor, then this AND gate will fail because this current will flow through the diode instead of pulling this line high. It'll essentially pull the output to low. Likewise, to check all the ground pins, if any of those ground pins are not pulled to ground, if they're instead allowed to float high by a pull-up resistor, then our diode OR gate will have a high output. All of these need to be low for this output to be low. And so that's exactly what I've implemented here. We have the check for the ground pins and we have the check for the voltage pins. And so let's break this down to just one channel and see what happens. We have our connector on the right here this is our servo connector, and for servos, pin one is ground. So this is the pin we wanna test. We have a pull-up resistor going to 3.3 volts, which means that if nothing is connected, this will float up. If we have a connected device under test and the ground is connected, then this will be pulled down to ground. Now we have a diode and a pull down resistor. And so if this is connected to ground, the output will also be connected to ground. We'll have zero volts here, and this will be pulled down to zero volts, which is our test, GP20. If this is unconnected, then it will be pulled up to 3.3 volts. We'll get current flowing through the diode and we'll see voltage at GP20. And now you can just stamp that out for as many channels as you need to test. We've just got the same circuit four times, one for each channel. And if any one of these pins is not being pulled down, then it will pull GP20 high. And we have a similar philosophy for checking the voltage on VCC or positive for each servo channel. Here pin two is positive. And if we come across, we have a very similar circuit. This is just a diode AND gate. And so all of these channels would have to be high to send GP21 high. And so to execute our test, we just make sure that GP21 is high and GP20 is low. Let's make it. Print out the schematic, grab the parts bin and start soldering the resistors. I've got my printed schematic so I can refer to the reference designators both on the schematic and on the daughter board. As always, starting with the smallest components first, we usually use 0402 in production, but for these test jigs, I'm using 0603 parts because they're a lot easier to hand solder. I could have got a stencil for this jig, but then we would have just had to curate the stencil and keep it somewhere. It's simple enough that hand soldering is okay. Now for the diodes, you can see that I'm soldering a single pad of each of those footprints first, and that way with the tweezers, I can bring the diode in and reflow just that pad to secure the diode. Then I can flip the board around and solder all the other pins. On go the four servo test channels. These are just standard 0.1 inch female headers. And now for the USB resistors and the USB-C receptacle. 
The motherboard's a pretty simple affair. There's a lot of components that we don't need to populate because they're intended for other types of test jigs. So I'm really just soldering a bunch of pin headers, a couple of PicoDev connectors. There's even a spot for a power supply load resistor so we can run this thing off a USB battery bank without the battery bank turning off automatically. And now to bring the motherboard and daughter board together. I stand off the daughter board using a couple of standoffs and then the two just plug together with male and female pin headers. Oh, and I kind of regret this unsightly gap. I fully plugged the pin headers into the, the socket header rather than having it flush with the daughter board. So there's a, a kind of a weird gap. I don't know, it just, mm, next time. Just a lapse in craftsmanship there. All of that aside, we've got a fully assembled test jig. We have our Pico to drive the show. We've even got a Pico to OLED to show the status of the test. I forgot to mention this before, but this standard jig has an option to include the OLED. We used to use colored LEDs, but you couldn't indicate as rich information. This OLED can actually issue instructions or give you really unambiguous feedback. So this has been a game changer. And it's kind of poetic that we have a Picadev device being used to test other Picadev devices. Nice. Our daughter board's on top. And this, uh, this sticker that I've put on is basically our way of indexing equipment. Everything is indexed, everything has a place, and so everything can be in its place. And it's really easy to find where this jig is on the shelf so we can use it. What do you say we take it for a spin? Excuse the air wires, this is what the jig will look like for testing. We have some helpful feedback on the display saying to connect the servo driver, and there's a few scrolling ellipses. That's just to show that the code is still running. If there's a crash for some reason, you don't want just a static screen, you wanna see that heartbeat so you know your jig's still working. Device to test. Step one, connect the USB connector. Step two, the PicoDev connector. Got a green light, nice. And the final step, plug it into the servo test headers. There you have it, we have a electrical pass and then an instruction for the operator to check for a green LED. And there's a little green LED here. That's the only thing the test jig can't check for at this moment is whether that LED is still working. I suppose we could put in some kind of like ambient light sensor here or a color sensor. That'd be pretty cool. And for completeness, here's what a failed device looks like. This device has a non-functioning USB resistor. And so this one is a fail. We don't really delve into providing any more information than that. We just want to sort pass fails. You know, I suppose we could have a mode where we can hold down the button and maybe show which exact test failed if we want to sort these into different bins for rework or repair. But I think this will do for now. But in any case, that's all I have for you today. We have a bit of a deeper dive into the art of test jig building and test jig philosophy. Now there are things that are just simply impossible to check with this test jig. For example, we can't check if this address switch is soldered correctly. There's no way for us to include test points on this board to check the switch to check this switch, we would have to actually have test points and we would have to move the position of the switch. And so there's a bit of a question about testing philosophy here. You could design a totally exhaustive test where you actuate this switch and you have test points on the board to look for that. And you have the test jig, instruct the operator what to do when. And you, you really increase the cost of testing there and you make a more exhaustive test. But I think for this type of device and the intended audience, this is an acceptable test. It could be more exhaustive, but is it necessary? And would you want everyone to wear the cost of that? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. What I think this jig needs is a guide plate to help uh, support those four servo headers and also to help prevent the operator from plugging the servo driver in the wrong way around or like being off to the side or off by one pin. So I imported the daughter board into Adobe Illustrator and sketched out the outlines of a plate with some cutouts for holes and slots for those servo headers. Jump on the laser cutter, cut it out, and just install it with some M3 hardware. And of course, don't forget to include cutouts so you can access the screws underneath. Every time, every time. And there we have it, a completed jig with acrylic guide plate. Thanks for joining us for another episode in Design a Product with us with The Factory. It's been a pleasure. I hope you've learned something. I know I have. And until next time, thanks for watching.
And final step, connect the pin headers to the pin sockets. We plug it in. Ooh la la. Why you do this? Now of all times. <laughs> Shit.